Greetings again in Jesus' name. You know, a lot of professed Christians in the system have no fear of God today about their being accountable for what they do because they don't understand the wrath of God. They think it's been paid for in advance. They think Jesus took the wrath in their place, so there's therefore no condemnation for them. There's no further wrath yet to come. They think they're going to be swooped out, raptured out in this phony end times nonsense that uh, so many of the pundits preach out there to make a lot of money. Well, the scripture says very differently about God and the nature of God and how it's not necessarily that he loves the sinner and hates the sin. No, he's angry with the sinner every day, the scripture says. You can't separate the two. You can't separate an action that the person commits from the person as though it's some kind of entity dwelling in him. Of course, I know that's what you people believe, many of you. In Romans 11:22, it says there, this. It says, therefore, consider the goodness and the severity of God on those who fell severity, but towards you goodness, if you continue in his goodness, otherwise you also will be cut off. So you got the goodness and the severity of God. Not just the goodness, not just the wonderful plan for your life, not just this sickly sweet nonsense, crazy love nonsense that these people like Francis Chan and other heretics, they like to go out there and tell the people that it's all forgiven, it's paid in advance, the jail door has been swung open, like in the phony Ray Comfort videos, and you're set free. You don't even know who paid, paid your debt off. All you got to do is trust that it's been done. And see, and that's how ridiculous it is, and that's why... This country's in the shape it's in, and this world is going down the path of perdition real fast. I mean, they might as well change the name of Washington, D.C. to Sodom and Gomorrah with the condition that our country's in right now. And it all rests upon the way they have presented the grace of God covering over man's evil doings as though God doesn't care anymore. Well, the Scripture tells us a big different thing. Jesus didn't pay for your wrath so that he could be your forgiver advocate, applying the blood and reapplying the blood every time you, you willful sin and spit in his face. No, that's not what the scriptures teach. You can't forgive what's already been paid for. You see how foolish the substitutionary system is that most of your, cheat, your preachers and churches preach out there. You can't pay, you can't forgive somebody when it's already been paid for in advance. We see that in the in the story of the unforgiving servant in Matthew 18. Now he owed a debt he couldn't pay, which represents the sin, your sin. So he begs the master for forgiveness and pardon. The master pardons him. Nobody paid his debt. Nobody had to suffer in his place. Nobody had to be thrown into prison in his place. Just by the grace of God on virtue of repentance, he was forgiven and pardoned of that debt on the condition that he continues, just like it says, the goodness and the severity of that master. Otherwise, you continue in his goodness. You extend that same love and forgiveness to others, which he did not do, and he forfeited that. But see, he couldn't, for, he couldn't forgive something that was paid for. He forgave just on virtue of mercy. The blood of Christ justifies the mercy of God extended to us in the reconciliation when we repent. I mean, you can listen to my atonement series in my Bible study series, and you get a full understanding of that. We went over that in great detail. But that's the biggest heresy of all time. And that's why you got unmerited favor or unconditional pardon, no repentance, no forsaking of sin. And then the, the, the supposed Christians are supposed to go out there and to people that have wronged them, people that have committed crimes against them as murder or rape or some horrible injustice against their family, or their family members, and then you just, oh, we forgive them, we forgive. Well, there's one thing, not showing any malice or hatred towards someone as wishing to pull the switch or, or uh, the trap door on the hangman's noose. That's, there's a big difference between that and being just, that evildoers have to be punished. They have the, uh, uh, they have the condition to repent and forsake their sin. But see, there's no remorse. They forgive just like they think they've been forgiven, just on... Even though the person showed no remorse, no forsaking of sin, no nothing, not, not even sorry for what they did. But see, that's again because of the way it's been presented. But see, in the scriptures, it shows us the raft, of course, abides upon the sons of disobedience. We see that, in the, we see that said in the scriptures. For the raft of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men 
who suppress or hold the truth in unrighteousness. We well, see, they hold the truth in unrighteousness by extending this unconditional pardon to the drunks and the porn watchers and the fornicators and adulterers out there without any, without any them forsaking their sin, without any imperative of them coming clean with God. But see, wrath abides on you. It's like it says, the wrath of God abides on the sons of disobedience. In Colossians uh, 3, in uh, Ephesians, it talks about the sons of disobedience. Also, it talks about the wrath being on those who obey not the gospel. They'll suffer the wrath of God. Will you obey not the gospel to go and sin no more, to take up your cross, to count the cost, to walk in righteousness and holiness all the days of your life? Quit making excuses that you can't do it, but come clean with God so that you can really be filled, filled with the Spirit. You can, then you can walk a victorious life instead of a life of ruin and failure. But do you even want to? Just like one guy said, the real question to the, these phonies is, if you could stop sinning, would you? Well, the real, the real idea behind that is, well, they, can't, they won't stop because they don't want to stop. It's not that you can't, it's that you don't want to. Many people out there that don't even profess Christianity live much better lives than 99% of the professed Christians in the churches. They don't fornicate, drink, drunken, porn watchers, and all the rest of it. We see that all the time with folks. I know many retired folks around me that they don't live that kind of a life, but they don't profess anything in Christ. It seems the people that profess it in Christ have the nobody's perfect excuse and the advocacy with the Father and the paid in advance uh, ticket, free ticket to heaven and license to sin. They're the ones living lives of debauchery in, in, the, in passing it off. But see, and even in Romans chapter 4, it says you're storing up wrath against the day of wrath because you won't repent. See, he says, uh, God, you despise the riches and the forbearance and the long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance, but in accordance with your hardness of your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath against the day of wrath and the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. See, Jesus said God sends the rain and the sun on the just and the unjust, and that God is no respecter of persons or a person's status. God doesn't take sides, so to speak, in men's affairs, only in those that pick up their cross and follow him. So in that sense, God's love is dispassionate. See, there's no emotion or malice or hatred, but it's just. Love does not rejoice in iniquity, but in truth. In other words, when truth and justice prevail, that's where love rejoices, the agape love of God. And if you have that love abiding in you, as John talks about in 1 John many, many times, walking in the light and in his love, well, then you'll understand and extend the same righteous judgment upon evil as God does. He's not going to allow the evildoer to go unpunished. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. And his ears are open to their prayer. But his face is set against those who do wickedness to cut off them from the remembrance, cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. See, this leniency towards sin just comes from this idea that you can't stop and it's part of your malady and it's inbred into you. So they, and they have this psychobabble of these focus groups and seminars and professional counseling and sympathizing with people that just won't come clean. So that's why you got pedophiles and abusers and incest. You got every conceivable evil going on inside the churches, and it's just passed off as they can't help it. And we just got to give them more counseling. No, you got to give them the mandate to repent. When Paul talked about the man in 1 Corinthians 5, he says, You don't even eat with such a fellow that's committing adultery in this manner. Bring them to shame, hold them up to open shame among the people among the people that profess to be following Christ in hopes that they'll repent, that they'll feel that shame and conviction on their conscience, and they'll come to a repentance. Not that God will affect repentance, like these phony preachers say. That's saying how God has to, has to uh, make that person repent. God has to make it happen. No, you make it happen when you take the step. But we got, like it says in that Roman, Romans chapter uh, 2, verse 4 and 5 I just read. Your impenitent heart, 